Hello, everybody, and welcome. You know, sometimes it seems like the world is more and more fractured, less and less united, but in fact, the universe unites us all. The cosmos is all of ours. We are part of the universe, and the universe is part of us. How do we access it? Well, astronomers today, my colleagues and me, we have telescopes on the ground, in orbit, under the ground, all over. We have the opportunity to access the universe from our senses to our instruments, all the way out to the observable universe's edge, more than 13 billion light years away. And a light year is six trillion miles, give or take, just so you know. But how about the rest of us? Well, it turns out that we astronomers have provided for the world literally millions and millions of gigabytes of our astronomical data free of charge to anybody who would like to download it, whether it's from the Hubble Space Telescope or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or any of dozens, hundreds of other surveys. You just need to type it up, you can get it, and it's yours. Now, what about people like Emma? What about my children? What do we do? Well, we like to have them answer, ask questions. Uh, my most recent book, The Handy Astronomy Answer Book, has more than a thousand answers to questions. But the very last sentence in that book, and in every book I try to squeeze this in, I say, the questions we have to answer are the ones we have yet to ask. And so today, Emma is going to ask me questions. <laughs> I am going to sit here. We are going to have seven minutes. I'm going to turn the timer on when we sit down. And we have seven minutes of questions where she just asks me questions. Some of them I have a sense of what's going to be asked already. But then when the timer goes off and I finish answering that question, she will ask me one more question. And I don't know what it is. I have no idea what this question is going to be. And I will do my best. In the spirit of science, remember, it is totally okay to make mistakes. We try to get it right all the time, but we are not afraid to get it wrong. We will do our best and we hope for success, we plan for success, we work at success, but failure does not diminish our efforts. And so it is in that spirit that we will start doing that. Emma, you ready to sit down? Let's grab a seat. I'm gonna make myself more comfortable, excuse me. <sighs> it's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling to gave none inside. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. All right. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? Won't you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Hello, neighbor. It's so nice to see you today. <laughs> Get on okay? All right. Ready? Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Start. Okay. Emma, go ahead. Why do, during a lunar eclipse does the moon look like it's changing colors? Great question. Those of you who've seen lunar eclipses before, the moon appears to turn red. And the reason is the light, the red light is actually always there. It's a part of the cause by refraction of sunlight through our Earth's atmosphere hitting the moon and then bouncing back to us. However, during regular moonlight, when there isn't an eclipse, the sunlight is so bright bouncing off the moon into our eyes here on Earth that we don't see that red light. It's kind of like having a little red light here and a huge big white spotlight bouncing off. And so when the total lunar eclipse happens, the moon's uh, being blocked by the Earth. So the sun's direct light can't hit it, and all we see is that reddish light. So that's why it changes color. Why are the tides and the moon related, and why? Why are the tides and the moon related? The moon is 240,000 miles away from the Earth. And when we sit here, and it's over there, it pulls on the near side of the Earth just a little bit more than the far side. And as a result, as we spin in our daily spinning, right, and as the moon orbits around the Earth, we get a tidal sequence where depending on where the moon is relative to where we are or the beach that we're sitting on, the ocean can be a little bit higher or a little bit lower depending on whether it's being pulled toward the moon more strongly 
or less strongly. So the moon is really important in creating the tides here on Earth. And by the way, those tides are also what create great volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, and also a liquid ocean on Jupiter's moon Europa, which might be the location of extraterrestrial life. <laughs> tides, everybody. How big are the rings of Saturn? How big are the rings of Saturn? Earth is pretty big, right? 8,000 miles across. But you need to put 20 Earths from one side to the other. And you'll just reach across the rings of Saturn, just the part we can see on a regular basis. There are other rings we can't even see with our regular telescopes, and they're much, much bigger. But these rings, although they're so wide across, many, many more times wider than our Earth is wide, the things that make up the rings are little itty bitty things. They're boulders, they might be as big as houses, they're not as big as mountains. Most of the objects are smaller than marbles or pebbles or even grains of sand. And it's amazing, isn't it, that the combination of gravity and rotation can organize all that matter into those perfect, thin, beautiful rings. <laughs> Do astronauts fly by stars on their way to the moon? Do astronauts fly by stars on the way to the moon? Turns out that they don't, and this is why. The distance to the moon is about 240,000 miles. The distance to the nearest star, our sun, is 93 million miles. The distance to the nearest star from that is more than 20 trillion miles. So when astronauts go to the moon, they do not pass any stars as stars. They see them really well, but they don't go past any of them. What they do see are some things that we human beings have put up in space. The International Space Station, the Hubble Space Telescope, and various other satellites that do everything from tell us what the weather's gonna be like tomorrow, to where we are in our cars, whether or not we have a prayer of finding parking on the Upper West Side. Uh, <laughs> Those are the stars that they pass. Not the natural stars, but the artificial ones that we create. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> How big is Pluto? How big is Pluto? Pluto is 1,471 miles across, I think. You have to check me on that. <laughs> Plus or minus a few percent, okay? So, if you put Pluto on the United States, just gonna plonk right on top of it, one edge happened to be here in New York City where we are now, the other edge would be somewhere in Kansas. So it's pretty big by our standards, but it's kind of small by Earth standards, right? It's actually even smaller than the moon. And it was the size of Pluto that made us begin to understand that Pluto was not a planet like the other planets in our solar system. It led us to new understandings of what our solar system was like and all the cool objects that are in there, including objects like Pluto. So that's a great question. Why can we only live on Earth? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we currently can only live on Earth. In order for us to live, we human beings, we've adapted over the many thousands and millions of years that we've evolved here on this planet to the conditions here on Earth. So we breathe the air here on Earth. We drink the water here on Earth. We are used to the atmospheric pressure and the gravitational pull and all those things that have made us here on Earth who we are. Now, here's the thing. If we could reproduce those conditions somewhere else in the universe, we could live there too. So right now, there's really only one place where all of these conditions are true, and that's here on planet Earth. But what a lot of people don't understand, you should all understand this, is that human beings have been living in space longer than Emma has been alive. Indeed, in the International Space Station, on other space stations over the years, we humans have been continuously occupying outer space uh, ever since the beginning of this millennium and a good period of time before the millennium turned too. So it's not like we can't live anywhere else. We know we can. But the question is, do we want to? 
Can we put all that energy in to make it happen? Right now, it seems like we're pretty comfortable here. But there is a good reason to think, where else might we live? Might we want to try? You want to check stuff out? It's kind of neat out in the universe, right? Yeah? <laughs> I want you to think about that because someday we will live somewhere else. We can live somewhere else. And if everybody works together and wants to do it, we will live somewhere else. That's seven minutes, everybody. And tap to stop, tap to stop. Okay. <laughs> Now it's time for the final question. This <laughs> member, I don't know what this question is. Lay it on me. Go, Emma. What are stars made out of? What are stars made out of? Stars are made out of gas and dust. That's it. <laughs> you and I are made out of stars that died long, long ago. You see, when a huge ball of gas in the universe somehow begins to compact together so that what used to be very diffuse turns into something very compact, something wonderful happens in the center. It's called nuclear fusion. And huge amounts of energy are released, so much so that it can shine on the surrounding planets and breathe life into those environments, including ours. Many years later, after stars have used up that nuclear fusion fuel, they will cast off their material out into deep space, which may float around for millions or even billions of years. Once that happens, maybe some future star will be born. Nuclear fusion starts in another gas cloud, and that gas and dust that came from that old star that passed away a long time ago coalesces to form planets. And then those planets eventually on them, thanks to the light and the energy of a new star, will form new things on there, including plants and people like you and me. So we are made of the stars, and the stars are inside us. We, you and I, you especially, because I'm old and crusty, okay. <laughs> You contain the whole universe in you. You are as awesome and as ordinary as every single star in the sky. Isn't that a cool thing to think about? Yeah, it is. It is. Remember, everybody, this is why we do this, right? I enjoy my research tremendously. I enjoy my teaching tremendously. But in the end, what matters is what is our connections with the universe? What is our connections with the people here on this world? As we have more access, sometimes we look on the internet or we look in newspapers and it seems a little scary. But to me, it just more and more brings together. Our differences are reduced compared to the things in the universe. It's nothing. When we understand that, that's when our world really becomes a great place. We're almost there. We're getting there. I see flashes all the time. And the places where I see those most beautiful and marvelous and inspiring flashes are in the faces of young people like Emma. So Emma, take a bow. Thank you all very much for this time. Thank you.